Now it's time for the last word with Lawrence O'Donnell. Good evening, Lawrence. Good evening, Alex. And uh, we have a Democratic nominee in the presidential campaign. Joe Biden has officially made it. So uh, we're going to be covering some of that, but also a lot of other defendant Trump coverage to get to. It is a big night. The general election is on. It, have a good show, Lawrence. It is. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Well, it was not a good day for the Trump fanatics on the Republican-controlled House Judiciary Committee, and it was not a great day for their star witness. Republican former U.S. Attorney Robert Hur, who was appointed to as U.S. Attorney by Donald Trump, conducted the investigation of Joe Biden's possession of classified material after Joe Biden left the vice presidency. That investigation found that Joe Biden did not commit any crimes at all. And we learned today in the hearing that Robert Hur's report about Joe Biden was not accurate in its description of Joe Biden as an elderly man with unusual memory problems. And you'll remember, that bit was the big news of that report, the news that was heard around the world about that report, and it is false. Today, Attorney General Merrick Garland released the full transcript of President Biden's five hours of under oath questioning by Robert Hur. In his report, Robert Hur claimed but President Biden could not remember when his son died. That is not true. In the transcript, President Biden says, what month did Bo die? Oh, my God. May 30th. And then someone else in the room with the president says 2015, and President Biden says it was 2015. And it's now easy to understand Joe Biden's anger about Robert Hur's false characterization of the president's memory of that tragic day. Congressman Eric Swalwell, who will join us in a moment, finds, found something else in the transcript released today of Joe Biden's testimony about Joe Biden's memory that Robert Hur deliberately did not include in his report describing the president's memory. I now want to turn you to the transcript and day one, page 47. You said to President Biden, you have appear to have a photographic understanding and recall of the House. Did you say that to President Biden? Those words do appear on page 47 of the transcript. Photographic is what you said. Is that right? That word does appear on page 47 of the transcript. Never appeared in your report, though. Is that correct? The word photographic? That does not appear in my report. Carson Swalwell zeroed in on a possible motivation for Robert Hur to slant his report against Joe Biden in every way that he could. A lot has changed since 2018 for the person who appointed you, former President Trump. Since you were appointed, uh, he was impeached for leveraging 350 U.S., 350 million U.S. taxpayer dollars over Ukraine to get dirt on President Biden. He was then impeached a second time for inciting an insurrection. He was charged for possessing classified documents and obstructing justice. He was charged for paying for the silence of a porn star. He was charged in Georgia for his role in January 6. He was charged in the District of Columbia for his role in January 6. He owes $400 million to the state of New York uh, for defrauding the state through his taxes, and he has been judged a rapist. You want to be perceived, understandably, as credible, and so I want to first see if you will pledge to not accept an appointment from Donald Trump if he is elected again as president. Congressman, I, I don't, I'm not here to testify like today about answer. what will happen it's in the considering future. Considering what I just laid out. I'm here to, I'm here to talk about the, the report and the work yeah. that went into it. And but you I, don't want to be associated with that guy again, do you? Congressman, I'm not here to offer any opinions about what may or may not happen in the future. So it's fair to interpret that what you just saw obviously means that what may happen in the future is that Robert Hur would accept a federal judgeship from the indicted Donald Trump or serve as the indicted Donald Trump's attorney general. 
Republicans on the committee kept trying to suggest that Robert Herr would have recommended criminal charges against Joe Biden if, Bi if President Biden were just younger, that it was simply Joe Biden's elderly, faulty memory that would make him hard to convict in a courtroom. But the truth of the Herr report is that it does not at any point identify a single criminal act that could be prosecuted against anyone at any age. It did not identify a single thing Joe Biden did that anyone has ever been prosecuted for. And the only classified material that Joe Biden knew he possessed was exactly the same material that President Ronald Reagan kept when he left the presidency and the and the Justice Department at that time believed that what President Reagan did was perfectly legal and they justified it. President Ronald Reagan kept daily notes during his time in the White House and Vice President Joe Biden kept similar daily notes during his eight years as vice president. Those notes would inevitably contain possibly classified information. And those notes were deliberately kept by Joe Biden following the legal precedent set by Ronald Reagan and the Justice Department when Ronald Reagan deliberately kept those same notes. And so the simple facts of the Biden case are there was no criminal prosecution because there was absolutely nothing that was even close to a criminal act. Democrats used the hearing today to remind America what it's like when the possession and handling of classified material is criminal. In your investigation, did you find that President Biden directed his lawyer to lie to the FBI? We identified no such evidence. Did you find that President Biden directed his lawyer to destroy classified documents? No. Did you find that President Biden directed his personal assistant to move boxes of documents to hide them from the FBI? No. Did you find that President Biden directed his personal assistant to delete security camera footage after the FBI asked for that footage? No. Did you find that President Biden showed a classified map related to an ongoing military operation to a campaign aide who did not have clearance? No. Did you find that President Biden engaged in a conspiracy to obstruct justice? No. Did you find that President Biden engaged in a scheme to conceal? No. Each of the activities I just laid out describe what Donald Trump did in his willful mishandling of classified information and his criminal efforts to deceive the FBI. Congresswoman Madeline Dean, who will join us in a moment, forced Robert Hur to make the case against Donald Trump by reading what Hur's report says about the Trump case. Unlike the evidence involving Mr. Biden, the allegations set forth in the indictment of Mr. Trump, if proven, would present serious aggravating facts. Keep going. Congresswoman, I'm happy to have you read the words in my report. Well, it's your report, so I think it actually is more fitting that you read those. Most notably, after being given multiple chances to return classified documents and avoid prosecution, Mr. Trump allegedly did the opposite. Keep going. According to the indictment, he not only refused to return the documents for many months, but he also obstructed justice by enlisting others to destroy evidence and then to lie about it. And we have new information about Donald Trump's handling of government-owned documents and classified documents from the witness who Special Prosecutor Jack Smith's indictment identifies as Trump employee number five. That employee, Brian Butler, said in a CNN interview that he helped Trump co-defendant Walt Nauta move some of the boxes from Florida to New Jersey. We got to the airport. I ended up loading all the luggage I had, and he had a bunch of boxes. You noticed that he had boxes. Oh, yeah. They were the uh, boxes that were in the indictment, the white banker's boxes. That's what I remember loading. And did you have any idea at the time that there was potentially U.S. national security secrets in those boxes? No clue. No, I had no clue. Brian Butler explained why he is speaking out now publicly. Well, I mean, it's... It's been almost a year since FBI agents showed up at, the, at my house when my wife was at home. And, you know, over the course of the last year, emotionally, it's been a roller coaster. You know, a couple of weeks ago, it, you know, Judge Cannon says she's going to release 
the names of the witnesses, you know, you go from highs and lows in this. And instead of just waiting for it to just come out, I think it's better that I get to at least say what happened than it coming out in the news, people calling me like crazy. I'd rather just get it out there. And Brian Butler offered this account of Donald Trump sharing classified information with an Australian billionaire. I believe it was April of 2021. Um, there was a member, Anthony Pratt, who he was coming. He, he flew in the night before. He's an Australian billionaire. He finishes his meeting with the former president, gets in the car, and his chief of staff says, how did the meeting go? Pratt, without saying, just says, he told me, and it would be, you know, U.S. military, you know, classified information of what he told them about Russian submarines and U.S. submarines. And that's really all I remember hearing. And I went, what? You know, I'm thinking this. I'm in the car. I'm like, did I just hear that? So it, it wasn't like, oh, the meeting went well. We talked about it. it was, he went straight to the point. He told me that the U.S. subs and with the Russian subs and, you know, something that would pro more than likely in my mind be classified. Leading off our discussion tonight is Democratic Congressman Madeline Dean of Pennsylvania and Democratic Congressman Eric Swalwell of California. Both are members of the House Judiciary Committee and both served as impeachment managers in the second impeachment trial of Donald Trump. Uh, and Congresswoman Dean, uh, I have to say one of the things that strikes me about the her report that I find so unrelentingly strange is that he keeps referring to uh, a possible presentation of the evidence in this report to a jury and how a jury might perceive it, when in fact there's nothing in the report that could ever possibly be presented to a jury. And this notion of how a jury would perceive uh, you know, President Biden's memory or his understanding of, of how he was handling those documents uh, just could not be more absurd, absurd with an evidence base that never comes close to rising to a chargeable offense. And that's exactly, Lawrence, what he says in his report. It never rises to that level. I'm so pleased to be with you, but also with uh, Eric tonight. Uh, Eric, uh, you and I have been comrades on the Judiciary Committee for a few years now, and I feel lucky to know you. Uh, I'm very Same. pleased with Same. what you were able to bring out today uh, in terms of testimony and, and in terms of the language of the report. Uh, and Lawrence, I think you're going to enjoy this, and I bet you paid attention to it. Did you notice that whenever um, Mr. Herr got caught in something, he slipped to passive voice? So, for example, when Eric said to him about photographic memory or whatever the exact word was, he said, well, that is the language of the report, not his report, not his language. Uh, so I'm somebody who pays attention to that kind of thing. But let's remember where this all began. Where it began was the very first sentence of the entire more than 200 page report, quote, and this is Mr. Herr's uh, language. We conclude that no criminal charges are warranted in this matter. And Lawrence, you saw in the report that state, same statement is paraphrased over and over and over again. Uh, sadly, uh, I think the report has very little credibility um, because beyond that, the evidence wasn't there. What was Mr. Herr trying to say? Mm -hmm. And uh, Carson Swalwell, the use of the word willful, President Biden willfully possessed classified, what they call classified documents. Uh, it's such a misleading thing for the general public to, to get only that and not have included in that, that the only documents that he willfully possessed, that he knew he possessed, that he deliberately possessed were his own handwritten notes, which is exactly what Ronald Reagan did with his own handwritten notes. And that was considered when Ronald Reagan did it by the Justice Department to not be criminal, and, be, and, and they made no attempt to even get those notes back from Ronald Reagan. And, and that's very telling, uh, Lawrence. Uh, but also, when you read the transcript, you see, uh, you know, the president has a clear handle on, you know, what uh, was unaccounted for, and, and he explains it as, you know, his staff 
uh, you know, were largely responsible. And he's such a kind person. He said, I'm not trying to throw the staff under the bus here. I don't want anyone to get in trouble. But uh, my notes were really, you know, the only ones that I uh, handled. And I think this is such a perfect side by side of two people. So put aside, you know, what you believe Donald Trump's intent was to take national security marked materials, as you said, different than handwritten materials. These are marked as national security materials that he possessed. Take away what you believe his intent was. You have two individuals who have classified materials at their property. One of them does everything to return the materials, allows the FBI to search their house just to be careful and safe, sits down for five hours of interviews over two days. That's President Biden. The other person does everything to conceal the possession of those materials, directs others to lie and obstruct about it, and still believes that even if he did all of that, uh, that he can do it anyway because he believes he's a king. It's just a real test of character and how both individuals handled it. Let's listen to the uh, demonstrations of Donald Trump's memory that the Democratic side of this hearing uh, was able to put in evidence in the hearing today, uh, juxtaposed to what the her report says about uh, President Biden's memory. Let's listen to this. Your next wife was a woman by the name of Marla Maple. Right. And um, sitting here today, do you recall what years you were married to Ms. Maples? Um, I'd have to get the exact dates for you. I can do that. Am I correct that you married your cur current wife in January 2005? I don't know relative to that date. And what years were you the owner of the Pod Hotel? I don't know the years. James Webb. I don't remember the names. I don't remember the name. So you don't remember saying you have one of the best friends? I, I don't remember that. Okay. I, I, have, I, know, I remember you telling me, but uh, I don't know that I said uh, and Congressman Dean, the evidence like that, along with the revelations that were the, the night before in that CNN interview of Mr. Butler about loading boxes to get them to New Jersey and all the other uh, incriminating uh, information that he revealed that we did not know uh, uh, until he revealed that in, in that interview, uh, all of that coming together at the same time as this hearing. It's really very sad, Lawrence. Uh, we could be angry, we could be all kinds of emotions, but it's really very sad uh, that uh, the president, the former president, uh, has uh, come out as such uh, a, uh, uh, I'm sorry, am I frozen? I apologize if I am. Um, uh, as, as such a person of uh, lacking of any, any decency. Uh, certainly his memory is, is slipping. Uh, there are some serious problems. Um, he has been under a 40-count indictment for all of the things uh, that he did in terms of documents that are at Mar-a-Lago. Uh, so the contrast is extraordinarily striking. And Mr. Hur, in his report alone, he himself, uh, and that's why I asked him to read part of his report, uh, points out the stark contrast between the two gentlemen and how they handled documents. Carson Swalwell, uh, Donald Trump cannot tell you when he married any of his wives or how long he was married to any of his wives and how long he's been married to his third and current wife. He doesn't know that. That's not information he knows. And there will never be, you can be absolutely certain, there will never be a headline anywhere about that failure of Donald Trump's memory. Uh, and Lawrence, uh, he referred in a clip that I played uh, to September 11 as 7-11. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. he, he stumbles all the time. Uh, and, and the difference, uh, though, you know, between Joe Biden, uh, you know, being asked the day after, you know, uh, Israel is attacked uh, about something that happened years ago uh, and, and having a clear memory of, of most things, so clear that special counsel called it photographic. And Donald Trump is not only, you know, does Donald Trump have memory issues, he's dangerous and he's under indictment and he's a narcissist. And uh, we just, we can't hammer this point home enough for the American people. Representatives Madeline Dean and Eric Swalwell, thank you both very much for joining us tonight. My pleasure. Thank you. Good to be with you. Coming up tonight, Joe Biden easily secured enough delegates for the Democratic presidential nomination. He did that before Donald Trump secures the delegates for the Republican nomination. Simon Rosenberg will join us next.
NBC News now projects that Joe Biden is the Democratic presumptive nominee for president, having secured 2,012 delegates. Votes are being counted in primary elections tonight in the states of Georgia, Mississippi, Washington, and Hawaii. On the Democratic side, NBC News projects Joe Biden has won Georgia, where he currently has 95 percent of the vote. In Mississippi, NBC News projects Joe Biden has won, and where Joe Biden has 99% of the vote as of now in Mississippi. And on the Republican side, NBC News projects Donald Trump has won Georgia, where he currently has 84% of the vote. And in Mississippi, NBC News projects Donald Trump has won, where he currently has 92% of the vote. We're still waiting poll closings in the state of Washington and Hawaii. Joining our discussion now is Simon Rosenberg, a Democratic strategist and author of Hopium Chronicles on Substack. Uh, Simon, as usual, uh, Joe Biden wins a higher percentage of Democratic votes than Donald Trump wins of Republican votes. Uh, what is there to read in tonight's results? Um, that we're in the general election. I mean, here we go, right? We've got eight months to go, um, and it's going to be Biden and Trump. And, you know, in every way imaginable, I would much rather be us than them at this point. I mean, Joe Biden has been a good president. The country is better off. The Democratic Party is strong in winning elections all across the country. And they have Trump, I mean, who's the most unfit guy to run for president in all of our history, who's leading a party right now that's broke, it's splintering. Uh, it's, you know, we're seeing a mass exodus out of the House. I mean, we're seeing an unprecedented level of turmoil uh, in, in the Republican Party, Lawrence. We, you and I have been doing this a long time. We've never seen anything as ugly as Donald Trump and the Republican Party right now. And so when I put all that together, as I said, I would much rather be us than them as we head into the general election. Uh, the Biden uh, campaign really went into high gear as a campaign the day after the State of the Union address, which was the most yeah. campaign-oriented State of the Union address I've ever heard. Yeah. Yeah, look, I think the big thing to me that's happened in the last few weeks is that the central arguments uh, that the Republicans have been making against Biden have all evaporated. The economy is strong. It's not weak. Inflation isn't rising. It's it's down. Right. We, crime isn't surging across the country. It's plummeting. Um, you know, there isn't a war on energy. We saw more domestic and, and oil, more domestic uh, oil and renewables produced last year than any year in American history. And in some of the other attacks on the border. Right. We're now the party that wants order on the border. They're the one that wants chaos. And the personal attacks against Biden, the stuff that they really went after in the Biden crime family attack, we just learned just in the last few weeks, this was a Republican, I mean, a, a Russian operation that was being laundered by the Republican Party again in our politics. And then finally, his age. We saw that he dismissed the challenges and the concerns about his age and the great speech that he gave last week. And then today we learned that the, 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 the uh, special counsel's uh, discussion about his age was actually invented and a lie. And so mm -hmm. to me, I think the th the biggest thing that's happened is that they've lost all of their central arguments against Joe Biden and the Democrats. And what they're left with is the madness of the orange emperor and Donald Trump. And it's not going to be enough to beat us in this election. The orange emperor. Simon Rosenberg, thank you very much <laughs> for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Lawrence. Pennsylvania Republican Congressman Scott Perry is running for re-election. Cassidy Hutchinson, the January 6th committee star witness, described Scott Perry this way in an interview with Pennsylvania radio station WTIF in October of last year. I think it is also important for central Pennsylvanians to know that Scott Perry was at the central, was, was central to the planning of January 6th and central to the planning of operating the Justice Department officials to execute a plan that Donald Trump wanted. And what Donald Trump wanted was to essentially shred the Constitution in any way that he could to stay in power. And Scott Perry has a lot of information about that. And I think that Scott Perry owes it not only to Central Pennsylvanians, but to Americans to share what he knows. Democrat Mike O'Brien is running for the Democratic nomination to challenge Congressman Scott Perry. 
Pennsylvania primary is next month. Mike O'Brien is a retired lieutenant colonel who served 20 years in the Marine Corps as a Top Gun fighter pilot and squadron commanding, commanding officer. Mike O'Brien said this in his campaign announcement video. Congressman Scott Perry and his far-right gang of insurrectionists are a threat to democracy and a threat to our freedoms. And that's why I'm running for Congress, right here in my home state of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania families need a fighter on their side who listens to them, who respects them, who cares more about them than about winning partisan food fights. This isn't about Democrat versus Republican. It's about American versus un-American. It's about regular people versus Washington extremists like Scott Perry. It's going to take all of us to save our democracy. So join me and let's do this together. Joining us now is Mike O'Brien, running for Congress now in Pennsylvania's 10th Congressional District. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, this, is, this would be a very important race for the Democrats to win. Uh, it, it is a, the kind of district that could, uh, with, with a great campaign, if you can deliver it, uh, it could flip to Democrats. What, what is your strategy going forward in this campaign? Yeah, that's absolutely the plan. And I'll, I'll say thanks a lot for having me on tonight, Lawrence. Uh, the good news, the district is winnable. Our governor, Josh Shapiro, he actually won the district by 12%. And in the 2023 municipal elections, the local elections, the Republican advantage was only 1%. So all this is going to take, it's going to take the right candidate. It's going to take somebody, I think, with a national service background who can appeal to the independents and the moderate Republicans. I'll tell you, with my 20 years in the Marine Corps, again, as you mentioned, I was a, a squadron commander, Top Gun fighter pilot. My wife, actually, she's still active duty in the Marine Corps. And we were the first married couple to command squadrons in the history of the Marine Corps. And I think that's something that resonates right here is service. Service resonates regardless of whether you're a Democrat or Republican. Is there a number one issue for your district? Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's beating Scott Perry. Uh, you know, I've gone door to door and people are tired of him. He can't hide anymore. He's he's now very much on the Mount Rushmore of extremists. And we've built we've built the coalition to be able to beat him this year. And I'm I'm really proud of that coalition. It includes a local the Teamsters Local 776. Labor is going to be a big part of it. Obviously, service based organizations like Vote Vets, Serve America. And the viewers are at home. You can be a part of this, too. If you go to Mike O'Brien for PA.com and contribute to our campaign to help defend democracy. Pennsylvania Democratic congressional candidate Mike O'Brien, thank you very much for joining us on your first campaign appearance on this program. I hope you can come back. Thanks for having me, Lawrence. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Well, no one has done more to expose the corruption at the Supreme Court than Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Now he's going after the Supreme Court's intellectual corruption. Senator Whitehouse joins us next. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse has a new complaint about the Supreme Court, which he explains in a new Law Review article for the Ohio State Law Journal. Senator Whitehouse writes, An appellate court unmoored from the factual record developed in the trial court may aggrandize its power like a knight errant roaming at will in pursuit of his own ideal of beauty or of goodness, a Supreme Court untethered from the fact-finding of the trial court or the fact-finding of Congress can craft facts that let it roam widely into policymaking. Senator Whitehouse explained the problem to the United States Senate. For more than a decade now, the Roberts Court has violated these basic principles, replacing facts found by Congress and facts found by lower courts with fake facts that they made up on their own. Fake facts that over and over just happen to suit the big donors who put so many Republican appointed justices on the Supreme Court. Shelby County and Citizens United, both those decisions, stood upon falsehoods presented as facts. And these weren't just drive-by errors in passing of no moment. These were false 
factual findings that were essential to prop up the logic of the court's holdings. No false facts, no desired outcome. And tellingly, even after events thoroughly disproved the false facts, the Republican Supreme Court refused to correct its mistakes. And so these faulty decisions, founded on false facts, live on like zombies plaguing our democracy. Joining us now is Democratic Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island. He's a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee and chairs the committee's subcommittee on federal courts. He is also the author of The Scheme, how the right wing used dark money to capture the Supreme Court. Senator Whitehouse, thank you very much for joining us tonight. And please go on about the false factual findings. Uh, could you give us some examples of those? Sure. I think, Lawrence, the most obvious one that uh, your many listeners will recognize right away is the false finding in the Citizens United decision that nobody needed to worry about corruption because all of the unlimited spending that that decision would unleash would be transparent that the public could evaluate the motive of the big donors because they would know who they were. Well, that's what the Supreme Court said, but here we are, multiple billions of dollars in secret money proving them wrong, and yet they won't go back and reconsider that false fact. Without that false fact, the decision falls apart because it, is, it was essential to the logic of that case. So are most of the false facts predictive uh, of what will happen if we rule a certain way, or are some of them actually false statements about uh, things that have already occurred? I think it's sort of, um, you know, you, when you're constructing an opinion, it has a logical analytical shape to it. And in order to get where the Supreme Court wants to go, they often have to fill in facts that justify and support the arguments and the logic of their decision. And what they don't do is follow the rules, which are, you should look at the congressional record for facts that Congress found if you're evaluating the support for a statute, or you should look at the judicial facts that trial courts found if you're looking at the facts that support a judicial decision. Whichever way you're looking, the American system of justice puts the fact-finding elsewhere than in the Supreme Court, and for very good reason. And yet you see these false facts continuing to pop up, to prop up decisions that produce results that the big donors want. And you can go through case after case after case, and if you look forward, what they just did in Dobbs and in Bruin, the anti-choice and pro-gun decisions, was to say, we're going to completely renovate the way we look at the law in these areas, and we're going to look instead at history and tradition, which means we get to make up our own facts about what history is and what tradition says. And that's why historians had such a field day making fun of the false historical facts that they found in those decisions. So it's a very broad pattern in the Supreme Court's political decision making. Yeah, I mean, on, on the Dobbs decision, when, when I saw that they were quoting uh, from old English common law, pre-colonial times, uh, to English uh, prosecutors and judges, I just immediately said, let's search and see how involved they were in which trials. Because if you were practicing law in England at that time, there's a good chance. And of course, both of them yeah. were judges is, in which trials. Which is a big deal back then to them. Yeah, and, and both of them were witch prosecutors, and both of them believed witches should be put to death. And it was their view of abortion that Justice Alito wanted us to adopt in the 21st century. Yeah. We have an American system of justice that is a very proven mechanism for making sure that facts are truthful. And that is that you develop them in the trial court, where the two parties can fight with each other over the fa fa facts, 
where a neutral judge makes a decision. And if the neutral judge gets it wrong, an appellate court can say, hey, you got the facts wrong, but then it's supposed to send it back to the trial court to get the facts right. You don't wait until you've had the district court trial and the circuit court appeal and the arguments in the Supreme Court. And at the end of the process, when nobody can say another word, that's when you parachute in a whole boatload of false mm -hmm. facts. That's not the way the system is supposed to work. For hundreds of years, it has not worked that way. And so this is a really novel trick that the Roberts Court has pulled. And it's so novel that, frankly, academia and lower courts haven't figured out a way to deal with it yet because it's a new thing. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, thank you very much for joining us once again in your pursuit of integrity on the Supreme Court. I wish the Supreme Court cared about it as much as you do. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you. Coming up, what's at stake for the world in the presidential election? President Biden is sending more aid to help Ukraine defeat Vladimir Putin's imperialistic war. Donald Trump praises dictators, including Vladimir Putin, including Adolf Hitler. Ben Rhodes joins us next. Today, the White House announced that the United States will send Ukraine $300 million in weapons and military support. The Biden administration has repeatedly emphasized that the money for Ukraine aid like that is mostly spent in the United States. $38.8 billion would go to U.S. factories that make missiles, munitions, munitions and other gear, according to figures provided by the Associated Press, but to the Associated Press by the Biden administration. That's if Congress passes the larger version of this aid. Today is the 25th anniversary of the 1999 expansion of NATO to include the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland, three countries that share borders with Ukraine. Earlier today, President Biden held a White House meeting with Poland's president, who is calling for NATO members to raise their defense spending by at least half to counter Russian war-making aggression. But Hungary's prime minister, Viktor Orban, met with Donald Trump last week and later said approvingly that if elected, Donald Trump, quote, will not give a penny in the Ukraine-Russia war. Here is President Biden's response to Donald Trump's willingness to let Vladimir Putin take over Ukraine. The fact is that you have a president who literally is invited Putin to do what it wants, do what the hell it wants if it could come into Ukraine. He thinks Putin is a strong, basically easy, decent guy. You know who he's meeting with today and down in Mar-a-Lago? Orban of Hungary, who stated flatly he doesn't think democracy works. He's looking for dictatorship. The only member of NATO. That's who he's meeting with. I see a future where we defend democracy, not diminish it. Joining us now is MSNBC political analyst Ben Rhodes. He's a former deputy national security advisor to President Obama. Ben, how does the administration f squeeze out that $300 million after uh, struggling now for quite a while to try to get a much larger package of aid uh, out of the Congress? Well, I mean, I think there are ways uh, that you can look at the accounting at the Pentagon and find different accounts where you can provide some of this aid. But the reality is the delta, the gap between 300 million and 56 billion tells you everything you need to know about how important it is for Congress to pass that funding. 300 million is not going to keep Ukraine afloat uh, when what they need is equipment at the front lines, small arms, ammunition, uh, artillery shells the lifeblood of a war in which Russia is trying to wear them down. And Donald Trump and the Republican Party are standing in the way of that because they're helping Putin at the expense of Ukraine. So it's very clear that uh, Vladimir Putin wants Donald Trump to win the presidency. Viktor Orban obviously wants Donald Trump to win the presidency. It feels very clear to me uh, that uh, Bibi Netanyahu would want Donald Trump to win the presidency but much prefer that, and then he would have absolutely no criticism whatsoever uh, from Donald Trump about anything uh, that the Israeli military did in Gaza or anywhere. Yeah, I mean, these guys, and they're all guys, uh, are not shy about helping each other out, this kind of group of autocrats. You know, Viktor Orban, uh, who's basically turned Hungary from a democracy into a 
a single party autocracy in a decade. I actually wrote a book about this process a few years ago. You know, this is like inviting Mussolini in the 1930s. Uh, this is a guy who literally wants to be the vanguard of undermining and overturning liberal democracy in the world. This is who Trump is hanging out with. It's not subtle that Putin and Orban and Trump and Netanyahu and a whole bunch of other leaders around the world represent a kind of authoritarian nationalist politics. And look, what Joe Biden represents is an alternative in which America stands up for our allies, stands up for certain values, doesn't want to see Putin rule over Ukraine, doesn't want to see a basic value like the sovereignty of a democracy in Ukraine get shredded by the likes of Putin and Orban. And what's really important to Lawrence is it's a foreign policy issue. It's about what happens in these hot spots around the world, but it's also a domestic issue. It's about Trump wanting to copy the playbook that people like Putin and Orban and Netanyahu have pursued in trying to undermine democracy in their countries. So it's about what happens here and what happens uh, around the world as well. And of course, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is the product of democracy. He's a democratically elected uh, leader as opposed to uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, but it seems so fully within Netanyahu's policy interests to have Donald Trump in the White House, who would never question anything uh, that Netanyahu or the Israeli military might want to do. Yeah. Well, first of all, Netanyahu has something important in common with Trump, too, which is that he's under indictment. Um, he needs to stay in power to stay out of prison, just like Donald Trump. He was undermining democracy in Israel before October 7th by trying to essentially uh, neuter the Supreme Court in Israel that led to huge protests. And now he has every interest in ignoring Joe Biden, uh, perpetuating uh, the war that is causing such a terrible humanitarian catastrophe, uh, and getting a friendlier uh, person in the Oval Office in Donald Trump. Um, and so this is a real dilemma here. Um, you know, Joe Biden wants to try to put some guardrails around uh, what Israel is doing in its military operation. You know, I. Uh, I've really urged that uh, over the last several months, in part because I had to see what Bibi Netanyahu was like to deal with um, firsthand for eight years. Right. Uh, but the reality is Donald Trump would represent a far more blank check for Bibi Netanyahu to do whatever he wanted, not just in Gaza, but also potentially going up into war in Lebanon. That's something that the Biden administration has really restrained Israel uh, on, escalating this war beyond even uh, the Palestinian territories. Uh, so the stakes are, are huge in this election about what kind of country we are, are we going to have another kind of copycat autocrat and Donald Trump here trying to undermine our democracy and whether the United States stands for anything in the world other than might makes right and the autocrats club does whatever it wants. Ben Rhodes, thank you very much for joining our discussion tonight. Thanks, Lawrence.